Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. Whenever we do webinars like this, masterclasses, I'm always very conscious of everybody's time and that everyone's very busy. So we always make sure that we deliver great value through anything like this. I've been through this webinar with Paul, Ben and Natalie before now, and there are some great, great learnings and insights to take from this. Uh, we're going to be going very deep and you're going to be getting some, I think, some really gold nuggets that you can take and apply straight away. And Ben and Natalie are very generously going to be sharing lots of those with you, showing you how you can get access to some of these resources that we, you're going to be seeing here and also how you can get them afterwards as well. Everything will be recorded and we'll send it to you. We're going to try and hit our timers as best we can. We will be finishing before one o'clock, but we're also going to be staying on the call as well to uh, answer any questions that, that we've got. So I will just introduce people. So Natalie, would you like to say hi? Hello, yeah, I'm Natalie. I'm from Payroll Sorted and uh, the title's a bit of a giveaway, but we're uh, an outsourcing payroll provider. Thanks, Natalie. Ben? Cool. Hi, guys. I'm Ben, also from Payrolls uh, Sorted as well. And to add to what Nat just mentioned, we help accountants to remove the time, the stress, and the hassle associated with the payroll function. Cool. Paul? Hi, everyone. I'm Paul from MAP, a firm of accountants in Manchester, specialising in the digital creative sector. We provide a full outsource finance function just for digital creative agencies exclusively and also go proposal as well. Yeah, and my name is James Ashford. I'm the founder of Go Proposal, and we help accounting businesses to price consistently and price more profitably. And recently, we've introduced Oversuite as well to help you to become more compliant as you do that. And I'm also the director of MAP as well. So, what you're going to, we're going to be going through today is the serious challenges that firms face with payroll, how COVID seems to have made a lot of this a lot worse for many firms, how we chose to solve this problem in our firm, and Paul's going to be showing some real great insights there the steps we took to ensure that we remain predictably profitable and how you can plug and play this approach when we get to the end of this process as well. And we'll have time for Q&A and we'll stay as long as you guys need for um, those questions. The challenges around payroll. So I I'm quite fortunate that I get to speak to lots of you guys um, around the challenges that you, you, you face and try and get to help you with some of these. And one of the things that I've seen, especially that ha happened last year as well, is that payroll can be undervalued by clients. But when I kind of scratch past the surface of that normally with firms, it's undervalued by themselves in the first place. And they, I know of firms who have positioned payroll as a loss leader. So they've had that as a loss leader, prepared to lose money on it or even break even, which was fine because they then made money from compliance services or made money from advisory services, which was fine whilst they were providing those. But then what we saw last year, certainly in our firm, is that some clients scale back on those advisory services. Clients needed more help than ever on payroll. Like you, no, Up until 2020, no one said the word furlough. And now like it's used in every other sentence, right? Clients needed so much more support and people hadn't built in the contingency in the way that they priced and sold that service to be able to accommodate for all the extra support that was needed. And so what was a loss leading service for lots of firms added to addition, additional pressure added on. And I spoke to a payroll department whereby that was leading to them being undervalued by the rest of the firm. It was leading to high sickness rates. It meant that they couldn't afford to bring in the staff that they need at the right level. So when they brought people in, they weren't skilled enough to be able to handle it. And it was just a constant source of, of real stress in their firm. And so I really understand the challenge um, specifically around payroll, the impact they can have. Paul? Hi, everyone. <clears throat> so uh, we're, we're about seven and a half years in now. Uh, provided payroll from day one. And initially, our, our structure, um, we have people called financial controllers. So they're effectively managing you know, all, the, all the systems and processes and relationships with clients. And we were asking them to do the payroll as well, in addition to that. And what we found is it, it became a real chore for them because for you know, upcoming accountants, qualified accountants, usually payroll is not the thing that excites them and not the thing that they want to focus on. It actually became um, a, a chore and a burden and trying to fit that in at month end on top of all their other work, which didn't reduce at month end, um, just wasn't sustainable. So we we, we we took the advice of other GoPros members as well, actually, um, who had successfully uh, brought a payroll manager into the business. Uh, the first one was a was a fail. Uh, she was a, she was a very nice person. We really wanted it to work, 
but she kind of admitted that she had oversold herself to us in the interview process and couldn't do the job, which was very frustrating. Um, and then we brought in uh, Tara, our current payroll manager, 21 years experience and just absolutely brilliant. Um, really well skilled at uh, managing clients as well as, um, you know, learning from all, all that experiences, m- mistakes, um, how to co- how to control clients and, and the payroll legislation in depth as well. The, the challenge then became, um, it, we were like 12 months in of, of Tara working with us and we were still having a lot of challenges um, and it was still very stressful. And I was, I was gonna say tear my hair out, but I suppose that's already been done. I've not got any hair left. But um, try, trying to understand um, how we could turn this around because we, we were regularly having conversations that um, she was feeling stressed. She couldn't quite get on top of the work. She felt like she wasn't able to give clients what she needed and give Matt what she needed and, and she wasn't feeling fulfilled. And I thought, if we can't do this with someone, make this work with someone with 21 years of experience, where's the answer and how are we ever going to be able to solve this? So the problems were that all the workload pressure was on one individual. So you'd have obviously all these emails, calls, et cetera, coming through from clients and there's no way that she could respond to all of those as promptly as she would like because we had 100 payrolls, 1,000 employees to look after, um, and she would get questions from employees as well as employers. So that was all coming um, on one person, and typically the nature of payroll is that most of it was bottlenecked around the same time of the month at month end as well. <clears throat> we don't have many weekly pay- payrolls or all, all month end payrolls. Um, it also meant that... Um, she couldn't afford to take time off because we had no one else available to do the payrolls and had the awareness of the systems and processes and, and clients and the, and the skills to do so. So she could never have a holiday during the last week of the month, which is obviously ridiculous. And she couldn't get sick during the last week of the month or do anything else because we needed a constraint on, on payroll. I was also very conscious of the risk of if Tara was to leave because I had um, one bad experience before her um but with the employee that didn't work out so we, we felt very exposed and also um i didn't have the the knowledge of what uh, a fully effective world-class payroll systems and processes you know sh- should look like and, and how to build that um and me and tara would never have got there with all the answers um ourselves that was the problems we faced and the goals um oh, it was like that just ben um explain your story paul then we'll come on to the goals next that okay oh sorry ben yeah sorry yes yeah yeah so yeah. thank you Paul. that's great thank you ben yeah well my payroll story i actually started off on the other side of the fence so going back a number of years in my mid-20s i had a small uh, recruitment business and a byproduct of me running that recruitment business i had a small temp workforce that i used to farm out so i used to have to make sure i'm paying them uh, employees or these temps that i had so at the time i had an accountant and uh just by default the accountant inherited my payroll my small uh, recruitment payroll and it's one of these things that I, I jumped ship set this pay, uh, recruitment business up and uh, i just thought payroll would be real simple uh, there was maybe a maximum that i ever had and maybe between six and ten temporary members of staff but it, it was a weekly payroll and every friday almost like clockwork i could guarantee that i'd be getting the phone calls from the temp saying oh my pay is wrong you've missed the hours off or my holiday pay is not you know not been included as well and it was a stress. It was a stressful situation dealing with each of the employees. And unfortunately, as much as I was trying to streamline the process with the accountant to make the payroll better, we never quite got there. So in the end, of this was this went on for maybe sort of two or three months. I had to change something. Uh, the employees weren't happy, so I actually moved the payroll function from my accountant and moved it to an actually a, a payroll uh, bureau. Uh, one literally down the road from us, funny enough. And that helped matters. It went a little bit smoother, but still for the amount of employees that I had, way too many, uh, way too many issues going on. But 
being on the client side of things, I couldn't understand. I was like, well, this, you know, there's eight people this week. Why are you making so many mistakes? So almost in my stubbornness, I thought, okay, I'm going to try a different way. And what I tried, decided to do was try try pay well myself. So I enrolled at the time on a, uh, on a Sage course, uh, got myself a little certificate, brought the Sage package. And for my little recruitment business, I started running the payroll in-house. And things were a lot easier. You know, I didn't have to sort of keep passing it on to the, to the bureau or to the accountant. And it just ran a little bit smoother. So here I was in my little recruitment business. Uh, and then what happened is the credit crunch hitch. This was sort of 2008, 2009. Recruitment wasn't a great industry to be in. And uh, I made my money from obviously placing people into jobs at the time. And, and that market was drying up. So I had to find another avenue. I had bills to pay and, and sort of a mortgage to pay as well. And I actually thought to myself, you know, if, if I've had these experience and these pains of payroll, is this maybe a service that I could offer to other people? business owners and in my naivety and it was naivety I thought okay let, let me see if I can build a business around payroll so I had a quick website done some flyers made up as well uh, did, used to go out of the night to live them out and I got unbelievably lucky cut stonk very long story short a uh, local accountancy firm they would see one of my flyers they gave me a call they're like just got your flyer coming the post yesterday uh, timing couldn't be better our payroll managers handed their notice in can you come and see me so I went and saw the accountancy firm explained obviously my background uh, explained obviously I was a little bit desperate I needed to get something off the ground make make this payroll business work and give them their due and thank you for me they gave me sort of 51 clients there and then and it wasn't until I was in the in the throes of having them 51 files sat on my desk I was then like wow I get why this payroll function is is so much harder um, so for that first month all of a sudden I was covering off a load of stuff I've never done before uh, maternity pay, redundancy pay, dealing with pensions. Uh, and I'll, I'll share as well. I didn't know what I was doing, guys. That, that was the reality of it. And I've, a little story I tell, thankfully, I had the Sage support desk at the time. And I actually broke the record. Actually broke the record. Uh, I knew more by first name terms. And I was phoning up every day. How do I do this? How do I do that? But that was great for me. That gave me great grounding into payroll. And once I managed to systematize and actually get the actual payroll processing right, I thought, great, you know, I've, I've cracked it and off we go. Go, but that really in my sort of payroll journey and as this business scaled up that that was only the start of it the biggest problem come for me was the people problem once we now then started having clients and managing the clients and uh, and then throwing them into the mix that was the hardest part for, for us getting the business to, to where we are today so hopefully today going through this webinar i can share some of them stories what we've done internally and i'm sure some of you will be able to resonate with some of the sort of people challenges uh, along the way as well that's great Thank you, Ben. So, Paul, if you'd just like to explain kind of what the goal, so we had these challenges in our firm. You tried it with one payroll clerk. We brought in Tara. Tara was doing great work. And then we now had this vision for what you wanted this to look like. Can you talk us through that goal for our firm? I think Paul's just frozen as we've done that. My back. He's back. We're back. We got you. Okay. So, Paul, what was the goal yeah. that you wanted to achieve with, with this? I think people often describe my payroll as like that thankless task. You know, it, it's it, it, it's one of those areas where clients aren't necessarily in and congratulating and celebrating a, a, a uh, accurate and stress free. So on time, obviously, we'd want things being left till uh, the the eleventh hour. Uh, because that can cause a lot of stress we want we want the payroll provided you know significantly in advance of payday accurate um because we don't want the employees coming to the employer and saying there's something wrong in my payroll i told you about this tax code change or this commission that we agreed or uh, the, the pay rise or, or whatever and then stress-free um it is as much about clients perception as it is our delivery so clients will remember how they felt long after they remember what it was that you did for them. So I think this is the most important concept, actually, that, you know, you might have clients paying you several thousand pounds a month for all the services that you do. And for you, payroll is a small percentage of that in terms of the fee. But if there's been a bad experience around one employee on a payroll for, for one month, that could start to leave a bad taste in the client's eyes. Just mouth, I suppose. Um, 
despite everything else that you're doing for them and all the value that that you're, you're adding in, in other ways it, it's how they were left to feel and they might not even remember why they felt like that they just remember have, having a bad taste because again an employee brought it up or you know it's, it's caused the employer's pressure for, for, from other people so value towards was, was about it being on time it being accurate and it being stress-free and we knew that if we could do that um that would open the door to being able to to to, to be on the front foot and make sure that we were um, reducing that anxiety, able to charge properly for it and make a profitable service because it's very difficult to tell a client that you've changed your pricing model and you're now going to be charging differently if the last three payrolls have been done at last minute or with errors or with stress. Um, so the, 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 the top one has to come first. You have to be delivering great value um, and and. and and being able to do things in in an organized way, ready to then start charging properly for it. Um, as James says, never believe that it that it that it needs to be a loss leader. I don't see why you should be having loss leaders in your business, particularly for the amount of stress and risk that you're taking. Everything that can go wrong with payroll to then not be getting rewarded for it either just seems crazy to me. Um, uh, and as I say, the risk that. Um, we had a client paying us three thousand pound a month, and you know the payroll was probably less than a couple of hundred pound of that. Um, and and yet one mistake on one employee's seven pound pay slip could undermine a thirty six grand annual fee. Um, genuinely, like if you look at lot of the terms with with ACCA, we work with if, if the client's got an issue, then they can start to challenge like twelve months of total fees. I think so. To say that you're going to take that incredible amount of anxiety on and do it and lose money it just seems crazy to me, and we we weren't we weren't willing to accept that. Um, and then the next part about profitable is is to avoid scope creep. So this is a bit we have done well from day one, which is to just control um, the pricing to say that every single month we're gonna you know we charge based on payslip. Therefore, every month we need to review how many payslips we're doing for you. Because if you've taken staff on, or um, you've, you, you've you've reduced headcount, then the price needs to adjust accordingly. And we're not going to be even two or three or four months in before we realise we made a mistake. We're going to get it right every, every single month based on the number of people on your payroll, and then everything else is included. Um, so it was about getting on the front foot, getting all of our ducks in a row, getting organised so that we could charge properly and the clients would be happy to pay for that because it's, it's a smooth sailing service. Yeah. Um, and all of that allowed us to, to focus on our strengths, which is effectively helping our clients to, to build better businesses and make better decisions. And that does also really include the data that comes out of your payroll system. Because for most of our clients and most of yours as well, the biggest cost, the biggest overhead is gonna be their team. So if you can start to analyze uh, the costs of the team, pick up patterns like, you know, the headcount might be staying about the same, but there's a lot of people coming, a lot of people going. You can start to see that and ask the ask the client questions. You know, there seems to be a high staff turnover here. Um, or we've increased the headcount significantly uh, without it really driving extra revenue. You know, do you want to have a fin- proper financial planning session? You can start to really get into the payroll data, but only if you're organized and, and you, you, you know, you're getting the basics right in the first place. Yeah, this is really valuable. That guy is just something to think about when when clients come to you um, and say that you know that or oh, this this extra thing that you provide us with is too expensive or they don't see the value. What they really mean is they don't have certainty in what you're providing them with. So let's say, for example, you've got a client and you go into them with monthly management accounts. So it seems expensive. You have to hear, we don't have certainty. And when you look at it, it could be because you've messed payroll up or you're making some silly mistakes with payroll. So now they've got members of staff giving them in the neck because it's the one service that affects the most number of people that you provide. So they've now got real grief in their business. So when you go back to them and offer these higher level services that you can make more money from, in their head, they're thinking, well, you didn't get this right, so I'm not going to spend money with you on this. Therefore, I'm going to say to you, it seems expensive. But what they really mean is we don't have certainty. And that was the big thing I got from what Paul was saying there when he when he went through this the other night, just that concept that we have to provide that solid, robust service if you're going to unlock the rest of the value with your clients. So in terms of trying to get there, Ben, what are some of the mistakes that you see in the, in the traps that people fall into on their way of achieving this? 
Yeah, sure. Well, what, one of the traps that we've certainly f sort of fallen into previously and, and what we see with sort of other partner accountants we work with is not being clear on what actually makes up the fundamental payroll service, i.e. sort of the clarity around the different components that fall into a payroll service. So this is something we did uh, going back about four years ago and definitely a worthwhile exercise as well. Grab a, grab a notebook and a pen, maybe grab the team around, around a whiteboard and just have a brainstorm. You know, what is our standard payroll service offering? Because with, with payroll, there's so many elements uh, or, or components that make up payroll. And from the client's perspective, you know, there's so many, you know, the umbrella of payroll, does it include holiday tracking? Does it include the pension element as standard? Uh, does it include CIS as standard as well? It, I think when we done it we come up with maybe sort of 14 different elements of what we were sometimes just throwing in within our payroll service so understanding you know what is the key service offering within payroll what are the additional things that really sort of homes in what the components are and with us being a payroll only company it was even more key that we did that and this is where for us go proposal was fantastic because once we brainstormed the different elements that made up the payroll we were able to put them into go proposal separate line items for each of them so when we sat down with a prospect we could clearly communicate build the value to say look this is our core service this is what you're getting these are the additional things and if you want these additional things this is how much it's going to cost as well so without almost knowing it by going down the go proposal model and having that clarity we were now charging correctly for the elements before we were just throwing in for free and the great thing about doing that as well and sort of managing that uh, expectation of what the client's going to get it removed that barrier that we used to have where clients used to say oh you're running my payroll of course you're doing the holiday of course you're doing the CIS where now we have something to refer back to and say no this is where it is so getting the clarity around the, around the offering it is really key and that also links in as well sort of another pitfall is James sort of mentioned it earlier as well, is not looking to make a profit out of payroll. As crazy as that sounds, you know, we hear it a lot from the partner accountants where payrolls may be wrapped up within, within a package to secure the accounts work, or if it's not thrown in for free, it's maybe done at a low cost to secure the work as well. And sort of that approach, it's, it's going to lead to issues down the line. If the money isn't in the payroll service, Typically, that's going to mean that shortcuts are going to have to come. So whether then shortcuts are around the processing, maybe reducing the time it's spent on the actual payroll because you need to get it out the door quickly, or maybe you know there isn't the budget there to go and hire the right people. And before you know it, you've maybe got sort of the wrong person in that payroll hot seat. Or the other end of the spectrum is there's no budget there at all. Uh, you can't actually grow the payroll amount of the business. And what then happens by default is maybe senior members of the team are then now running payroll. So Paul mentioned it as well before. And we refer to that, me and that, sort of when we speak to partner accountants, you know, you're on that payroll treadmill. And that payroll treadmill is, if you're not charging correctly for payroll, it's really hard to get off that because you can't make positive change. The time's not there to make the change. There's no breathing space at all. So the easiest way to get off that payroll treadmill is split out the components, make sure you're charging, understand, you know, what each of the components consists of, and that will help just sort of transition from that payroll treadmill, as we call it. So once we once, once we get through the pricing element of it, sticking with the pain of payroll is the next bullet. And that I'm going to hand that one over to you because I know that's one that you love speaking about. Okay, thank you. James, if I get too echoey and loud, just tell me to... Uh, it's quiet. Good, good. <laughs> okay, so yeah, so sticking with the, the pains and problems of payroll. So um, with my role, I spend quite a lot of time um, talking to uh, potential partner accountants about the options around outsourcing. And the common sort of uh, message that I get from them is that providing a payroll service actually causes them a lot of problems and headaches, um, and they feel exposed to risk in providing those services. Um, and as we sort of covered up before, that it's not always that profitable for them. Maybe they're not charging correctly for it or their department's not running particularly efficiently. Um, so they're spending a lot of time on something that doesn't make them much money and that's taking them away from, I think Paul touched, touched on it earlier, the core sort of function of their business that where they add most value to their clients. They're just spending more time on payroll than is necessary. And the, the kind of message that comes across is they've, they've potentially done that for quite a long time. So they've had this problem of pay payroll and they just kind of kept on that treadmill, just thinking, right, we'll tackle it, we'll tackle it and not getting around to it. Um, that seems to be really a really common thing. Um, and the reason, the various reasons why they sort of carry on, on that route, I think, is um, things like they've tried outsourcing before and it's not gone particularly well and they've ended up bringing it back in-house. 
or if they if they don't necessarily want to outsource or they want to sort their internal department out it takes a lot of time and effort and resource and the more you're putting into the payroll it's easy taking away that resource from from the accountancy function so I do think that there's a few reasons why people sort of think oh payroll's a problem and it's it's causing us a headache just kind of just carry on on that same kind of cycle um I had a conversation I think I was telling you the other night I had a conversation with an accountant um earlier this week looking at their options and, and and talking to us about maybe using us and he was saying that they've got one person in their payroll team and it sounds similar to you know the, the Paul Tara situation um and he just felt massively exposed so if that person was off sick or went on holiday or god forbid resigned um it was it was a single point of failure for them because Although the payroll is not the sort of the main part of their service, um, if they fail to deliver on a deadline or if they're trying to get people involved in payroll that don't necessarily understand it, they make a mistake. The consequences would be massive and it's had a damaging effect, you know, it have a damaging effect on the current relationship. And, you know, the trust element <laughs> is so important. And once you've lost that trust, if you keep making mistakes or you make a big mistake that has, you know, a massive financial impact, it, it's really hard to get that trust back. Um, and I think that then leads on to the next point about sort of outsourcing. When people are looking at their options and looking at their department and sort of deciding what the right thing to do for them, I often get asked about white labeling. Um, now we, not everyone will agree with this, but from our experience, white labeling is a trap that we've fallen into as a business and our partners have also fallen into. We used to offer it as a solution, not something we do anymore. And the reasons for that is we found that if, <laughs> The, having that facade, pulling the wool over the, the client's eyes isn't always the best way to do. And that comes back to trust as well. So it's all very well thinking, oh, you know, I don't want to outsource because I don't want the clients to have negatively perceive that as a disjointed service or that we're not, you know, we're not giving them the service they signed up for. I think when you're looking at outsourcing, just be transparent about it and um, be honest. People like to know where their data is, who's got access to it. So I think white labeling is a is a bit dangerous if you're thinking about trust in relationships. So um, that's that's our recommendation. If you're if you are considering it, don't go down that route. Sell the benefits of partnering with a specialist to provide the best service possible and allowing you to as an accountant to focus on you know, the areas that, that you can offer them most value. Um, and that kind of brings us on to our next point, um, which is whether you are looking at outsourcing or whether you're just looking at your own uh, internal department and, and payroll and what you want to do with it, then we've been doing this for 10 years. We're still learning, like we're still learning all the time, but we've definitely got some things that we could share with you today that hopefully might be helpful and give you a bit of an idea of like what you could do um, in your business when it comes to payroll. I'm going to hand over to Ben because this is his baby. Yeah, thanks. Ben. Okay, so the first step that we believe uh, in offering a great payroll service or running a great payroll department, it's got to be stopping the errors. So it's a slippery slide and a lot of you guys out there will be able to resonate with this as well. Uh, once the mistakes start going out uh, and the client picks up on them, uh, that definitely builds up an element of distrust. And that, that can be really hard to win back that relationship as well. Uh, and as, as sort of mentioned already as well, how that can lead to other issues in the service level and clients looking at things collectively as well. So the key to stopping that is getting the controls in place uh, to reduce and safeguard against the mistakes as well. And for us, that is the checklist. So so we've tried running uh, payroll loads of different ways and you'd be amazed at how many different things we've tried. But from the test and measure that we've done every single day of the week, using a checklist 100% helps reducing the errors. You guys will know this anyway. You know, you probably use checklists in other areas for uh, the account side, the bookkeeping side as well. Uh, the interesting thing that we check this from my point of view as well these aren't how-to guides so these aren't you know prompts of actually how to run the payroll this this is a 20-point checklist and we're going to make this available for a download for you guys at the end as well but this this checklist here it stops the silly errors and the silly mistakes that happen so we might run a fantastic payroll here a really complex payroll uh, which the client you know never sees that element of it but if we then send the payroll out and forget to attach the p45 or we attach forget to attach the uh maybe the pension letter for the new starter, straight away that's deemed as a failure. So the checklist that helps us just to eliminate them small and silly errors and just a couple of things on there, you know, pension uploads, go back four years, you know, that it was a whole new thing, we used to miss it. So the checklist just safeguards against that going forward. So 
please feel free to ha have a look, look, look at that basically. So the other, other element from a quality control point of view is actually checking the work as well. If you can do this and you've got the resource, this is a no brainer. So I think it's a human tendency that when we, we, know, we don't spot our own mistakes. So what we do here, we, we're quite lucky that we've got a, a dedicated quality control department uh, with checkers in there. So the account managers run the payroll and every variable payroll as a minimum must go over to, to the checkers. And their, their sole job, as negative as it sounds, you know, is to find fault. We would much rather deal with the issue and, and resolve it internally rather than it go out to the client and then they're picking the phone up and saying you've made a mistake. So uh, checking it 100% again just helps reduce the errors. Uh, appreciate some of you guys out there won't have the resource to have somebody else check it. And that was me. You know, when I first started as well, I didn't have a, other people to check the payroll. So what I used to do, and again, maybe you can roll this out internally as well, is I used to wear two hats. So I'm a processor, my checklist in, I used to work it down. I could, you know, maybe tick off the timesheet, get to the end of that process. I'd maybe break for a minute or two, come back with my checker hat on, and then uh, just a high level, just go back over the timesheet or the instruction. And the amount of times I found something uh, myself going, back over it so that that definitely helps no two ways about it so uh yeah it it, it helps so that helps stops the errors uh, and there are so many moving parts and that checklist is helps pick up on their on their moving parts so uh, hopefully you can, you, you can grab something from there so I'm just, one, gonna, add, I'm just gonna add into there but then sorry yeah. just I, I can't you know stress how important checklists are yeah I, I did a study there was a famous study done years ago sorry about um, saving lives in hospitals and it all came down to checklists and when they implemented them they halved the number of avoidable deaths in operations and but people get annoyed at using checklists and what was interesting is they asked the the hospital staff how many of you want to even though we saved half the people's lives how many of you want to continue using checklists and most people said no we don't want to continue using it and then they said next question if you were being operated on how many of you would want a checklist to be used and everyone said, we do. This is right, you're using them. So checklist is the ultimate way of doing it. And having the check for the checklist is really smart because whatever you expect, you have to inspect. It's the ultimate part of any system. So you really need that in place. That's great. And thanks for sharing this as well. We'll, we'll send the links out. Are we on to the next slide, Ben? Yeah, absolutely. So, so the next one is that that's sorting out the errors and stopping them. The next thing for us is, is actually capturing and understanding the, the, the client's payroll data. So Nat, back over to you, explain how we how we track that and what we suggest. Yeah, I'm gonna to have to catch up with the video here. So sorry if I ramble on. But there, yeah, um, so over the last few years, there's been a few things that we've done that have really been game changers for us, making us more of a, an efficient and profitable team. So some people listening today will be already electronic. Uh, we went electronic about four years ago, is it then? Um, yeah. And that was our first step to being um, extremely efficient and allowed us to build as you can see here on the uh, screen is our client knowledge board. So um, the whole idea about going electronic and centralizing our knowledge base was it took away that vulnerability of relying on particular individuals in the team. Um, we used to be running on spreadsheet, different account managers have their own accounts managing spreadsheets, hard copy files, all those things were really difficult to manage. Um, so having that, that central knowledge base is really key and going electronic helped us do that. The next key thing we did was uh, get, we obviously have a payroll tracker. We've always had that, but it's an extremely robust payroll tracker now. So it obviously has the key dates in there of the date client, the dates in the pay slip. So we don't ever miss a deadline on that front. Um, and as you can see here going across, we, we've got a view at all times of where we are um, in our payroll tracking process. So whether we actually process a payroll, if it's a sign off, if we've got a timesheet, and that's across the board. So our whole team have access to this all the time. Something key to mention as well is, is track how long it takes you to process your payrolls. So um, we actually time every single payroll every single time we run it. And that feeds into our pricing as well. Um, so we're able to look at whether we're actually pricing correctly and if at the complex payrolls, you know, how long they're taking up in terms of resource. That's really important too. Um, and I've massively gone behind on my video, but on this last uh, screen here is what we call a stop board. So you could call it whatever you wanted. You don't have to do you know, fancy software to do any of this. You just need to find a way to centralize all your information. Um, but our stop board is basically, I don't know how many of you will still be using hard copy files, but it's that sheet at the front of the folder that tells us the, the sort of the specifics about the client, you know, who to CC into a particular email, what report needs to be attached that's different to the norm. And they're the things that always used to trip us up. We could run the best payroll in the world and then we'd send it out without a report attached to it that the client's expecting. And it just undermined all the effort we put into the payroll because they're like, for God's sake. 
how how long you know how, how many times you have to do this before you're going to remember to put it in there so that system just means that all of our account managers um can filter by their um their clients and just not miss those things and it's part of that processing checklist we looked at earlier to get the, te- the team to um, go and check that board before they send anything out. So it's just that extra step in there just to stop the silly things from happening. Um, it also means we're not reliant on uh, individuals again. So that's the key thing. We are totally system-led. And I, I honestly believe that any parent department or, or company being system-led um, it is really you know, the way forward. Uh, from a client perspective, they understand when they send their instructions in the exact steps that happen before they get it back and the timeframes around that. So the way that we work is not just a system for us, it's a system for the clients as well. It means they've got a, a repeatable um, service from us uh, and also sets out their obligations as well, what, they, what they're committed to to allow us to deliver their payroll on time. So I think that's really important. And I know, you know, I'm talking to accountants here. Um, so you've all probably very much system led when it comes to the accountants, uh, the accountants side of things. But when it comes to payroll, I think sometimes it gets put on the back burner a little bit. Uh, and so if you're looking at improving in-house, then yeah, hopefully some of these ideas might help you sort of structure the department in a way that makes you profitable and, um, you know, efficient. So, um, yeah, so that's that's the system side of things. Uh, let, me, let me just interject there, Natalie. So mm-hmm. just the importance of that is communicating that to the client as well. So Absolutely. very very often people have internal systems, but mm-hmm. unless you can have a way of communicating the system to the client, this client doesn't understand how they're meant to fit in with that mm-hmm. process. And that's when they don't value what you do. Yeah. And sometimes when, I, when I'm working with partners and onboarding them, they get concerned about, you know, our clients won't like it um, if, if you say they've got to get this in on time and you start putting clients in. But we never really get any resistance because I think they actually appreciate understanding what they've got to do, when it's got to get in by. And it takes that uncertainty out of it for them. So I definitely, yeah, it's been really helpful for us, and especially with partnering as well and that whole sort of uh, migration of the clients across to us. Uh, but just what you mentioned, James, brings us on to this next slide, which uh, Ben's going to take, which is the rules of the game, which relate to the clients. So. Mm-hmm. And, the, and what we've spoken about so far in three sort of bullet points of what we can do, the great thing about that, that's all within our control. So, you know, going from the checklist, the quality control, the systems in place, that's something all of us can, and, you know, got the time we can implement. Where it gets a little bit trickier, and I often joke with the team here, you know, payroll would be great for us if we, if we didn't have clients that we had to deal with as well. As soon as clients are put into the mix, things definitely become a lot more complex. And for us, uh, Nat keeps using the word systems. I keep seeing, using the same terminology of game changer. But this was a game changer for us. So the rules of the game is a phrase that we coined from James, actually, one of, one of the training uh modules we went on with James but what this you know to run payroll successfully you've got to take control and be in charge of the process as soon as you're not as soon as you're sort of the clients dictating when they're sending their stuff in and you're flapping in the wind it becomes really hard so the, the rules of the game for us are used to manage manage their expectations you know this is an opportunity for us to define our deadlines explain obviously when we want the information come in why we need it in on that particular time the format we want it as well and uh, uh, just puts us back in control of, of that process. Definitely the hardest thing, don't get me wrong, the hardest thing to implement, the people element of, of running payroll. But with the rules of the game, it works so well for us now. So we had to go with our whole client base. We went back through and did this with, defined the deadlines again. Every new client would do the same thing. And what that's done for us as a practice now, we no longer have them demands. I'm sure some of you can resonate with this. So Going back, we'd had the situation where a client at four o'clock on a, on a given day would be sending across their payroll hours and phoning up and expecting us. Oh, I've just sent the time sheet in. I need it back by five o'clock tonight because I'm going on a holiday tomorrow. I need to pay my staff. That was a common thing. You know, we, we were just flapping in the wind, going from trying to make one, one client happy onto the next one. So where we are now with our rules of the game is we, we use a, a terminology here of conditioning, or Nat refers to it as gentle conditioning. And what, and what the team here and what we do from the outset is just condition clients or see what our rules of the game are. So that scenario, that four o'clock issue, that still might happen, but the clients, our clients now understand that typically if that happens, we are going to charge them uh, accordingly to, to to do that because it's a knock-on effect um you know i've been there running weekend uh, payrolls for people where they haven't got the stuff in uh, on on time and uh, it does have a negative impact on the team so the rules of the game uh, i'm going to use it again it was definitely a game changer for us 
Okay, so the final slide, uh, for every great payroll service or every great payroll department, you need to make a profit. So how can that be achieved? So the slide here, this is obviously geared up to our model, which is an outsourcing model, uh, but regardless of what we're looking at, the, you know, the outside of it can either be deemed as an outsourcing model or an employee. It's, it's definitely open on, on both ways. So this is, this is a real life example. Uh, this is a partner accountant who I think I actually saw their name pop up earlier, so I know they're watching this, uh, but they come on board with us maybe three, four, months ago now so fairly recent uh, but where they were with within their practice is that they've grown really really quickly and hadn't really considered payroll as as a service you know they've gone out there marketed extremely well gr great concept of what they were looking to do so they'd scaled up didn't have a designated payroll person within the office so what, what happened then by default is the payroll was spread across two or three key members of staff and where it was it had basically taken over the, the, the practice especially the last week the last 10 days of the month they almost couldn't get any other work out the door because they had no systems in place the clients were chucking in the timesheets when they wanted they were being so reactive to it so they reached out to us they had 63, it's all on the screen, 63 payroll clients. Of that 63 client base, there was 20 director only payrolls. And that left 43, what we class as say proper payrolls with, with employees. On average, uh, across the board, they had between six to 10 uh, employees and their largest client within that 63 was a 46 uh, person variable monthly payroll. The great thing with, with this particular client, they are a Go Proposal member. So where they hadn't got the systems in place and they weren't, didn't know really what they'd done on payroll, they'd got the pricing right from the outset. And you know they weren't they were charging i think it was five pound a pay slip then it dropped it down to four as the illustration says but they had they had a bit of margin in the payroll so when we looked at their client base you can see on the screen here they were charging them 63 clients uh generating revenue of just over two thousand pound a month so when we then put the same 63 clients through our uh, calculator we were then charging them effectively just over 1500 pound so this was for the, for this particular practice it was an absolute no-brainer straight away they could they did and again they didn't know if they were making profit they had all different people in in the payroll mix and the reality is the amount of time that were going in there for the inefficiencies they probably weren't making profit so when we just illustrated this to them uh round figures they were making 500 pound a month profit for outsourcing it to us but the biggest win for them was all of a sudden they got that resource time back internally. The two or three members, they were now back to what they should be doing, which is bookkeeping work, accounts work, and where they've got to now as well, it was great for them. They've now got a real scalable model. So every time they take on a new client with payroll, by default, that comes over to us. They know straight away that they're making a profit. And what's also been interesting with their client base as well, where they were all over the place, and I'm sure they won't mind me saying that, the, the client has now perceived you know, what the service level has actually gone up. So by giving us the payroll problem, when they come straight into our system, the level of service has gone up as well. So they're making sort of £6,000 a year. In fact, they've grown already since then. They, they were making sort of £6,000 a year straight away by outsourcing it to us. But that was only purely for the payroll. You know, they, these guys also were charging for additionally for re-enrollment, which they make a margin on as well. So that that was the that sort of an example there. Whether it's outsourcing or you get it right, how you can make profit from payroll just by charging right for it, really. I love that. Whenever any prices are presented, I always say kind of they're for illustration purposes only. I'm not yep. saying you have to charge these prices. They're just kind of in, um, um, an example uh, of how this could potentially play out. But what I love about this is creating a predictably profitable model. They're my words. Mm -hmm. I just love predictably profitable. So when people look at it, they actually burn. They're hardly profitable at this service. I was conscious of time, Ben. Um, yep. And I know how much you love to speak. So um, <laughs> waffle, we're going to go. <laughs> and talking, so, and talking a waffle as well. So I'm hoping that some of the stuff we've, we've actually waffled on about there might be of some value and you can implement it. Uh, and that will be useful and, and no doubt would make your lives a little bit easier or at least your payroll lives a little bit easier. So but I'm going to show you how you can help them. Yes, there you go, Ben. Yeah, how we can help them. So what, with us, we, uh, we're an outsourcing solution, uh, like having your very sort of own out of the box payroll department without the hassle and grief that comes from obviously looking after payroll, proven methods in place where you can literally plug yourself and your client base into our systems. And the best bit, as illustrated before, once done, you can obviously make a profit from payroll as well. Uh, plus we've developed these tools that are coming on the screen at the moment uh, to help keep you in the loop, in that payroll loop, if you wanna be in the payroll loop. So every partner that works with us 
gets their own visibility portal, uh, various dashboards that report in real time exactly where we are in the client cycle uh, and, and where we are and what's happening on the payroll. Plus, we're ultra transparent as well. Uh, we've never lost sight of the fact these aren't our clients. These are your clients. So we communicate through these dashboards as well exactly any issues, any concerns that we've got that we want to make you aware of from. We put these in here. Uh, another non-negotiable of our service as well. We insist on monthly keep in touch calls as well. These are your clients and we want you to be aware of exactly what's happening with them. And if we can suggest a better way of doing things as well. So that, that's that there. How to get on board with us. That's the easy part. Uh, we start off by delving in. A uh, quick fact find, understanding what the client base looks like, map out a plan to take over, help you communicate the changes to your clients, take care of the migration process. We do it all basically to get you out of the headaches of running payroll and over to us. So what is next? Uh, make your way over to our website. In fact, I'm, I'm quicker than the slides here, James, but any, any moment now, our website will be coming up. On the website, we have a dedicated page you can see there for accountants. Scroll to the bottom of that page, and at the bottom of that page, there's going to be a section popping up anytime now, which is where you can download our payroll resource pack. Within there's the checklist, some education emails that we send out to uh, clients as well. Feel free to use them in your own practice, might make life a little bit easier. Or if you're thinking, no, I just want to get rid of payroll, Click on the get in touch button at the top there. That will take you into our discovery call area where you can book a call with myself or Nat. So hopefully that makes sense. And one last thing, James, that's why I can quickly jump in from our experience, uh, the clients that can make the uh, transition and those accountants that are already making a profit from payroll, it's no surprise to us that they're already using GoProposal. So GoProposal really does help break them elements out uh, and just make sure that you guys out there are charging for each of the components of payroll. Thank you, Ben. Can, can people just send them slides a little bit blurry? So you can just send the link through to Morgan. If you can just paste the link into there, please. But it's um, payrollsorted.com forward slash accountants. Accountants. Yeah. And guys, just to be aware here, like the checklist that these guys have built and what they go through that's been added to and evolved over the years is a tremendous asset and a real piece of IP that they built. You know, we, we've spoken at length before this. They've very generously shared this with you guys. So if you go onto their website there and go and get that resource pack, you can go and download that, which I think is just wonderful and see what, what it is that they do and how they can help you. So before we move into q and I'm just going to briefly explain for um, Go Proposal members um, again, sorry if this screen is blurry, I don't know why that is, but the way that we would advocate is, as Ben said, to split out all of these services very clearly so that when you're communicating the fees to the client, you can show them what all of those costs are. And then in real time, you can actually present that fee of that service to the client so the client understands exactly how that cost has been arrived at and how that's been built up. That's really important. And GoPros and members on here will know that and use that. If, you're one, if you've not got payroll services in your system already and you're with GoProposal, it's very easy to add them in. You just simply click the payroll services button. It will then ask you two very simple questions, which is what would you want to charge for one person running payroll? And what do you want to charge for up to 10 people after that? It's the only question you have to answer. Off the back of that, that will automatically import all of that pricing for you, ready to use out of the box for you to then go in and edit and amend and get those prices working exactly as you want them to be so that you can generate the levels of profit that you're looking to generate in your firm. Finally, anyone with Oversweet, uh, anyone with GoProposal who now is aware of Oversweet, which is our own engagement letters, which is intelligent engagement letters built with such experience in there that automatically get generated for you. What we've built out for you here as an extra treat for Oversuite subscribers is now within every, uh, if you go into any service line and go to Oversuite and look at the service schedules, we have built out all of the payroll sorted specific uh, service schedules. So you can drop those in so that all of your legals are covered. And you can see exactly what that entails there. And this is really important to get this right, not just from a service schedule for, for individual services, but as Natalie referred to earlier, um, with regards to kind of the data processor element as well and understanding where that risk and liability is. So again, we've added that into here, which is the data processor agreement that gets payroll sorted on the hook effectively. So if they do anything wrong, you can blame them. <laughs> but that's exactly how it needs to be. You need to ensure that the liability of this service sits with the right people. And that's a huge part of what, what they do. Um, Paul, they're the two links. Sorry if you want to go and get them again. 
Um, so payroll sorted if you want to get a demo with them or if you want to go and get the resource pack very generously shared. If you're not with GoProposal yet, sort it out, dive in with us. And if you've not got Oversuite yet, you can get a free trial of that GoProposal members. Just log on to your accounts page and hit Oversuite and you'll get that. Paul's come in here and I feel he's got some wisdom to share. <laughs> absolutely nothing just want to be <laughs> polite and come on but um just to say uh morgan and i have both mentioned it in the chat but we are going to get through every single question so we'll stay as long as you are willing to listen um it's easier for us if you can put the questions in the q a just because there's a lot going on in that chat and we can't directly respond to each question then so okay. if you can put them in the q a that will really help us but no i, I suppose seeing as all you put me on the spot just to say that we are about four months in now Ben and that yeah. into working with map um and and for full transparency um we we have that combination now of, of the payroll manager in-house and payroll uh, sorted as, as the outside provider um and i've been speaking to tara recently and it's genuinely like speaking to a different person like it was 12 months of heartache of ringing her and hearing her in pain and typical um, hard-working employee she didn't want to reach out for the help she didn't want the help she f kept feeling like no it's okay I'll get her to next month again and it, it took me to step in and say no Tara this is enough you've been saying this for 12 months and if it's not got better over a full 12 month period we always said from the beginning we don't know whether this is achievable with one person four days a week she's four days a week when we've got a thousand employees to look after and 90 percent of those fall within in the same week I don't know that, that I said I didn't know that was achievable and now I'm quite convinced that it's not achievable and now just her voice um you know the way she's speaking the way that she's able to switch off at night and look after a little girl um and also the other things that she's now bringing to the business is just puts a, a huge smile on my face in terms of like we had a client recently and you'll all smile when I say this but it was the isn't it just the push of a button um line uh, to do the payroll you know I've, I've already got I've already got zero I can do payroll on there it's just a click of a button and I've got 10, 10 employees as well you know it's not like it's a one-man band and somebody on maternity um, <clears throat> problems getting auto enrollment uh, submissions working properly etc and I spoke to Tara and I said I've not pushed her too hard I've just said to this client just be careful of the risks and responsibilities of running a payroll and also if I was you as a director the last thing I would want to be doing is processing the company's payroll there's better things you can do with your time and then tara responded to me within a few days and she provided a list of all the risks and responsibilities of auto enrollment um the risks of zero as a payroll software because we use zero as a payroll software for two or three years from we, we were the guinea pigs from day one we moved to bright pigs it was more robust so with she's explained to the client the, the risks of zero payroll software and the and the, the, the benefits of bright Bay and then the benefits of using map and payroll sorted as their payroll provider as well um she, she's she's developed systems and processes relationships with clients you know she's now acting like the payroll manager that we knew she was capable of being because much of the processing is now getting dealt with by payroll sorted that's brilliant thanks paul we're going to go through these questions now ben natalie and paul you can answer the questions and if i can just encourage a punchiness to the answers <laughs> that'd be really appreciated because there's quite a lot thank you so people keep asking what is the system that you're using so you, you show to the one way you're kind of tracking all of the data is that a bespoke system that you've got is that a piece of software people are asking about that i mean so uh, that's yeah we we come from the excel spreadsheet monday.com is what yeah. we use uh, and it's not bespoke it's we designed it ourselves i designed it everything we're looking at there as well so it's not hard if i can do it i assure you it's really uh yeah, a bit of learning in there but yeah mon monday.com is what we use Cool, thank no, you. What it's knowing what to put in it, though, isn't it, Ben, to be fair? That, yeah, that's where the, the yeah. Hype yeah. Is. I've undersold it there, yeah. That, that's, that's taken us about a year and a half in the making. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's a long year and a half. It, it, it is achievable. It is achievable, yeah. Yeah, cool. What are you using to track payroll? Yep, we use exactly the same. It all links in. So monday.com uh, run, runs our business. It links in from the knowledge into the scheduling. Every account manager here gets a dashboard. They can see every day what the workload is. They can see what the estimated times are. The monday.com helps us. We, we track reminders, takes care of the whole payroll cycle, basically. Yeah, someone's here saying whether uh, the service line should be marketed as part of the accounting practice or under a separate brand, both to the practice and to non-practice clients. Does that make sense? I'm not quite sure. Yeah, about that. yeah. No, yeah, I understand the question. Um, depends on what you're trying to achieve, really, and what, what you're setting out to do. Um, 
and, and you know if, if you are looking to be a full finance function and you want that all all under one brand um if you want your team fully getting involved you know, you, you, you know, i think the danger is going back to my fc example before is that whatever it's under under exactly the same brand um clients will continue <coughs> con- continue to approach the people that they're used to dealing with especially if they've dealt with them in, on payroll in the past, but also just if they've got a client relationship manager, account manager, client manager, whatever you call them in your firm, they'll keep birth into that person if it's under the same brand. Yeah, that's cool. Got two really good questions here from, from Lindsay Bennett for, for Ben and Natalie. Really mm-hmm. good questions. Um, fear of outsourcing payroll. Will this not just add another step into the process where we have, where they have to become the middlemen between the client and now you guys? And how is this problem prevented? And I'll go straight to the next question as well, which is what stops the client then from just jumping ship and going directly to you guys? Mm-hmm. Okay, let me let me jump in and answer the first, the first question as well. So, uh, which was what the first question? The first, the first question, question was, doesn't this just add an extra step, complicate things further to, mm-hmm. because they now become the middleman? How mm-hmm. is this problem uh, prevented? No, so the whole idea is we take away the middleman option. So most accountants, the way we way we explain and the way we've done this quite a few times with accountants now, is just being upfront with the client. So we be, by being upfront with the client and basically saying, look, we are struggling potentially with payroll, or we, you know, we're, it's holding us back. We want to be able to concentrate on on helping you save tax, and we're burning up obviously resources on, on payroll. We've gone to the market, we've found a great company, and they're going to be looking after your payroll. So it's not the it's not the fact that the accountant will remain the, the middleman. The communication comes from the client for payroll related straight to us and we then deal with the queries the questions the what happens in this situation how does this work we take care of all that queries and questions becomes our issue basically the four o'clock phone call can you sort this out for me you handle all that you 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 condition the client respectfully (laughs) and gently condition them yeah yeah cool and then what about the problem i've handed them all over surely you're just going to nick my clients yeah, such a short-sighted view for us. Uh, again, I'll share as well. The 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 model the model works fantastic for us. So typically, we love working with ambitious accountants that want to grow their business. As they grow their business, we typically acquire a client every time they take on a client as well. That short-sightedness of going direct, we ne- it would be the most short-sighted thing in the world, and just not the more one it's not who we're about anyway uh and we and we have got that and again let me uh, not not going into one of my stories james i'll try not to but what we were trying to do where we are that that separate function sometimes we get wind where we're our account managers they're trained in this to sort of understand when clients are making certain noises so the client would say to us oh we know we haven't heard from the accountant for a couple of months or have you heard from them at all we flag that and we come back to the account in the keep in the keep uh, keep in contact meeting and that would say you might want to give your a quick call they're feeling a little bit unloved so if anything we're going to try and promote you guys in nice. there to try and look after your clients and what if the client came to you direct and said uh thank you can you run the payroll for us instead of pay you save us some money? We, wouldn't, we wouldn't do it we'd, the first first thing we would do is phone up the account and explain exactly what's happened and what they've asked cool we have actually had had that happen yeah. before and it, that's exactly how we handled it we contact the partner explain the situation and if they said, you know, we don't want you to take it, we wouldn't take it. But on that occasion, they actually said, yeah, go for it. But we would never look to. So, yeah. Cool. What format do you have the client's data sent to you in? Yeah. So at, at the moment, we're quite flexible on that. So uh, we are, we typically, it comes in via email is how it comes into us. Uh, as our second quarter roadmap, we're going a little bit more technical. And we're having a, 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 an all singing, all dancing uh, information capture. But at the moment, we, we try not to upheaval too many things. So typically, most clients are conditioned at the moment to sending an email, either with an instruction in an email or a timesheet within that email as well. We, we can take it in that format for sure. That's brilliant. You do um, do something else for new starters, though, don't you, Ben? Like a new yeah, starter form. Yeah, that's really point, yeah. So, so yeah. going back to us being in control uh, and our rules of the game, starters are always a pain point. Where I don't, guys, you, you've been out there where you get you maybe you get half the information, you're missing the starter form, you're missing the P. So what we have, we have our own uh, starter and lever forms, and these can be branded to your uh, practice as well. So what we then do when a client has a new, new employee, we will send them the link, and that's how we capture it and streamline that process for starters and levers. Rather than going back and forward and trying, you know, sort of piecemealing the information in, we capture it all in one form. But again, that comes from the conditioning and explaining to the client. So this is when you get a starter, go onto this link, and it works a treat typically. It helps the cool. clients as well because it, it, it tells them exactly what information we need to not have to keep going back and asking more questions. That's worked really well. 
Cool. James, can I, can I just add an add-on? I know you're trying to rattle through them, but this will come up anyway. Jeez. So what, whilst we're on it, is just um, a lot of people are already using BrightPay on here, so they'll be very familiar with the BrightPay portal. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, we're starting to get questions now as to mm -hmm. why you use an email and not the BrightPay portal to gather information. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a two-pronged attack. So people using BrightPay, if they are conditioned to go into the Connect, upload their details in there, absolutely fantastic. It takes a whole layer of uh, aggravation out of the way. Uh, so if we could get every single client that we've got to do it that way, that would definitely be the preferred model for people using uh, using BrightPay uh, in the Connect feature and getting the instructions coming in that way. But we also understand how hard it is to get clients to actually that upheaval of getting them to go into the portal, so understand another bit of technology. So that's why we can offer both both options for people that aren't using bright paid preps and are still doing it the traditional traditional way, basically. I like it. Cheryl said, uh, we're keen to move to a cloud-based payroll system, have looked at bright pay, but understand it's not currently cloud-based, but the comments suggest that it seems to be. Is it or is it not? No. So it's not. So with, with BrightPay, the actual data would live, isn't in the cloud. The Connect side of it, and again, I'm, I'm not here to promote BrightPay. That's not what we do. We just happen to use it. The Connect side of it is, is cloud-based. So without me trying to get too technical and going massively off track, the actual data that's in the payroll, the employee record, the employee year-to-date values, that would sit effect that's non that's not cloud-based the mechanism of how we can communicate the pay slips and how the requests come back in that is a cloud-based function cool. i've got i've got a brilliant question here how can you not that the other questions haven't been brilliant so everyone else sorry your questions have been brilliant it's just a very brilliant question how can you encourage the client to limit the number of changes once the payroll has been produced we really don't want to charge extra but do want to discourage that how do you handle that Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's interesting. On that, on that download pack, we've actually got our sign-off email that's in that download pack. So what we do, every variable payroll, we will send to the client for approval, or we call it a sign-off. And within there, that starts the conditioning phase of it. So when we send it to sign-off, our clients, typically, they are allowed one change at sign-off. So if all of a sudden, go back to the rules of the game when you're Pacific from the outset and saying you're allowed one change at sign-off, uh, that allows them, oh, we've forgotten to include someone's holiday or somebody's overtime. We will make that change as part of the payroll service. What we don't want to get into when we're talking about taking back control of the situation and the client, if all of a sudden the client is changing their mind two, three, four, five times, we're on this vicious hamster wheel of just doing it for free. So we will condition the clients, we'll explain to them. And if you tell them the reason why, you know, it's no different to me. I get the analogy I always call another story, James. If I get a decorated down round, and I ask them to paint this wall in this office. And then halfway through painting the wall, I'm like, actually, can you paint it another color? I would expect him to charge me more to go back and do it. The same principle is, is that principle of the sign off and the changes yeah. as well. There's got to be a rule in place where it could be two if you wanted to, but you need to stick to something and then charge additionally for it 100%. But you know what, as well, the, the, the knock on effect that has is that this is the same frustration with every service. Like, you know, people wanting extra things all the time and pushing you on it. To my mind, payroll is one of those fundamental foundational services. If you can condition the client right with this service, the knock on effect is that they they don't then start to do that with other services as well so you're training them mm -hmm. to value this you're not just training them to value this service you're training them to value every single service as well so when you've now got more transactions going through with bookkeeping they're not just going to expect you to do it so it, it's it's a really great knock-on effect that starts to happen mm -hmm. paul mead has asked do you offer a service of making payment to the employees Yes, so uh, not directly, we don't. So we team up with a BAX provider. So we offer that 10% uh, of our client base, we offer a BAX service for roughly that, is it, in the moment? About that. It's like we actually didn't do it until about 18 months ago. So we've only been doing it for 18 months, but it's been, been working great with them, isn't it? Yeah, we take care of that as well. Is this service available in Australia? Not at the moment, maybe one day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or we can find someone who can work with proposal. That's fine. Yes, um, Michelle, let's find that person. Kay, do you communicate with the clients directly if we were to use your service? I love this one. Of course, yeah, completely. It's all from us. So we have a centralized mailbox for our payroll team and each account has a dedicated account manager as well. So they, once we've done that first month with our onboarding team, they get allocated an account manager and they take over everything. So the whole idea is you don't have to get involved in payroll at all. We deal with it entirely for you but obviously keeping you in the loop make sure you you know you know what's going on i love that do you use zero payroll no no cool Not is fine. there a minimum charge or a minimum number of clients no 
No, cool. Do you offer a HR solution as well, or is it pretty much a transactional solution? Yeah, just transactional. Mm-hmm. You're getting really good, really good answers, guys. I love it. Um, <laughs> We've nailed the promptness now after an hour. <laughs> what is the best way to charge for employee questions after payroll? How mm-hmm. much mat pay will I get? I am moving abroad. Can you help me work out my residency status, etc.? <laughs> okay, so okay. questions after sign of am I right to take this, Ben? No, I think yeah. you're going to look at different. I think, yeah. So for me, the queries and the questions are fundamental. We, we have proven methods how we can stop them in the outset. But the questions will always come. So as a general rule of thumb, we look at a question. And again, going back to our rules of the game with the client, if it's something we think we can answer within sort of a five or 10 minute thing, if there's a quick answer, we will go back and just deal with it as part of the service. If it's something when we look at it and go, okay, that's definitely going to take us more than five or 10 minutes to go back and answer that, our clients are conditioned. We typically have a per half an hour charge rate in there. Again, we're very transparent from the outset. We explain this to the clients and we that's going back to positioning from day one. This is our payroll service. This is what you're paying for. You get an element of support in there. If you want to know scenarios of what happens if you change someone's those pay, that's going to be treated as something additional and we are going to charge you for that. That's no, great. Just add to that, that that's in the schedules as well. So in the um, Go Proposal schedule, that's yeah. put off as like, a, you know, be aware that, that there are additional charges outside of general scope. Nice. What about the interaction with QBO and Zero? Do you send or post a journal? We uh, send. send. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. What happens with the client's emails regarding payroll? Do your clients get to email the clients? And if do your clients get you to email the clients? And if they email them direct, they just forward it to you to deal with. Yeah. Also, if you don't white label it, what stops the client just going to you direct? It will be cheaper. Oh, you've, you've answered that one. So just the first part in terms of comms. Uh, yeah, so obviously in the first month or so, generally the, there's always a handful of clients that can't quite adjust to the going to, to us direct. So we just work really closely with the partner. Every time they get a payroll-related question, they'll just bounce it back to us and we go direct to the client. And eventually it, it's not a problem. Within a month, people give up sending it to the wrong place. Let me jump in there as well. So this is this was a learning curve for us as well, where, again, the clients are so conditioned to speak to their accountants about payroll. So the more of these we've gone through over the, over the period, we've got better at doing it. So every time now a, an accountant communicates with their client, they're saying, look, we're, we're, we're going to outsource it to this fantastic payroll company, Payroll Sorted. Uh, we then get in contact with our initial email, lay it out there again, very simply about communication side of things. And we call them before every pay run now as well, introduce ourselves and just explain again to back that up. Anything payroll related now comes into, into us and we will deal with it as well. And we're guaranteed turnaround times as well. So we respond to every email uh, within a four hour window as well. Yeah. And I think the way to position you guys, or the way we position you guys is, look, we're always focused on providing you with the greatest level of service that we can. And if we think there's a way of doing that better than we can with our team, then we will do that. And we have found that with these guys. So like you say, that enables us to now focus on either, you know, other higher value activities that we can work with you on. And what I love what Paul said is, and I think I know where this pain is coming from, rather than going into, you know, we offer a board level service with our clients, rather than going in and getting it in the neck about why we've messed up payroll again, we're now going in with data to be able to help them to plan out when, you know, put it into their budget and their forecast. When should you be taking your next member of staff on? Actively helping them, you know, how much should you be paying for that member of staff? That's what we obviously, I, the other bit I've not mentioned it with Go Proposal, Mapper are our accountancy firm and you run our payroll for us, right? For Go Proposal. Mm-hmm. And so what it means now is we can go to Paul or our map team and say, when should we take, we're looking to bulk out our success team. We, we've taken on more uh, clients. When should we employ this next person? How much can we afford to pay for the next dev? They're the questions that I should be asking, not ringing Paul up and busting his whatever's for the fact that a, a member of staff not had the pay rise, right? So the value that Paul's bringing us now and that we now see from MAP is absolutely through the roof because it's data around payroll and staff that's useful rather than looking at the leakages. Mm -hmm. Okay. What about CIS? What are the process charges there? Yeah. Are you doing it? <laughs> yeah, so, so again, that for us, it's an element of what comes on that payroll umbrella sits separately as well. So we charge, uh, there's two elements of CIS. Uh, we charge, gosh, £5 per uh, suffered submission each month as well, just £5, and £5 per subcontractor as well per month as well. Mm-hmm. Cool. Is there a portal where clients can download the pay slips? Yes. Yeah. Are you prepared for an influx of clients, you? <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> well, you, you, but to be fair, that you are to an extent, aren't you? You couldn't yeah, just take course, on yeah. h- hundreds of films. Yeah. You will always restrict it to what you're able to deliver the level of service for. So you couldn't yeah. have 300 people on this webinar. So yeah. not everyone will be able to get you, but yeah, that's cool. <laughs> do you not try to go direct to do their payroll and cut out the middleman? I think we've had that question, Sue. Mm-hmm. There is no going direct. They're very much in support of the relationship with the, the clients. That wouldn't work. Is there a minimum type? It seems to be a frequent question, just to add the reassurance. So we we started off um, first, uh, you know, first payrolls we ever had were with an accountant who's 10 years on is still with us. Um, but we do have direct clients as well, but we're actually not seeking out direct clients, are we, Ben? That's not the model. So the model is more not more effort. That, that's where we want to be. We want to be that go-to provider for accountants yeah. in the UK want to outsource. The direct clients, it's... It, you know the, the effort that goes into on board a direct client it's you know it's, way, it's, way more yeah. but it, it's understandable where that fear comes from you know not to yeah, not yeah. the software companies but like the software companies kind of side with the accountants and let's sell software to them then the next thing you start to see their adverts where they're now saying you can come to us and it's just a push of a button and you're like hang on a minute i mm-hmm. thought you're on our side whose side are you really on so I, I think it's they can get burnt so i think to know they've got people who are genuinely partnering them is is really useful mm-hmm. is there a tie-in period or a minimum number of payrolls that needs to be passed over None at all. No, but you need to give it a chance. I would, I would suggest if you're trying something, you need to give it a few months to at least give it a fair crack of the whip. Is that fair enough? 100%. Yep. Yeah, okay. How does it work with Tara using an outsourced service? Does she keep the client contact, Paul? Um, <clears throat> do you want to answer this? Because you're obviously working with her yeah, today. So, uh, so there's quite a few methods of communication. Now, isn't there with mm-hmm. Slack and email and BrightPay? So if you want to yeah. just describe that. Yeah, so the way that it's working, and, and this isn't a, a typical model for us, um, but the way that it's working is that uh, we the clients are using the portal to, to provide us with their payroll instructions and we communicate with them through the portal. So all of the clients that we've taken over um, to help Tara, we communicate direct with over the portal. If something comes into Tara relating via email to the, the map, mail, oh, sorry, Ben, what? Yeah, what I'm going to add in there as well, and the reason that relationship works is because Paul's rules of the game around his yeah. payroll service are the best we've ever seen. So he has got his clients being able to communicate through mm-hmm. that bright Paul Bright Pay Connect portal. And that's something we we struck, you know, so the fact he, the rules of the game he's got in there were fantastic. And that's why he can offer that level of service and it cuts down so many issues. So, yes, yeah, of course. How do you best gather payroll information and changes from your clients? I think you've covered that, haven't you, by the portal and by your email? Yep. Uh, if I go to payroll sorted, do you deal with a client? Yes, you do. do I, can I just forget about payroll is the question? 100%. That's, that's the whole idea of the service. <laughs> The- but, you, but you but you informing them with their monthly meeting mm-hmm. with the accountant mm-hmm. that's the key part yeah and obviously if something happened during the course of the month that we thought the partner needed to be aware aware of we just pick up the phone and, and let them know but the idea is you don't need to get involved in it and the other thing going back to what paul said as well from a pricing perspective for payroll where there is obviously a lot of accountants and should be charging per pay slip as well we take that grunt work as well so at the end of every month they get a full schedule itemized per client how many pay slips on there any additional things so they can take that and it really acts easy to be able to follow the schedule and invoice out based on that yeah that's great any tips on charging for extra furlough calculations um reworks due to client errors not using our templates to enter data etc yeah so the reruns the reruns put furlough to one side because furloughs yeah we'll probably be debating that's about five o'clock tonight but with with the reruns as well so this this for me as well again is cut back to the client conditioning uh, as a general rule of thumb we we explain this to clients or our direct clients from the outset uh, to say that you know if if we have got to go back and rerun the payroll Typically, there's sometimes more work involved in the rerun. We've now got to, you know, maybe re-upload the pension. We've, we've got to do amended uh, FPS submissions. So we explain that to them that we're going to effectively doing the job twice and we are going to charge them for it. So as a general rule of thumb, up to 10 employees, Nat, correct me if I'm wrong, we typically charge 50% of the payroll fee for a rerun. Anything over 10, we will look at it subjectively and just base it on a per half an hour price, I think. Just to sort of set, Ben, off the top of your head last month, how many reruns did we have, like client reruns, do you reckon? Uh, so, so what, client changes? or Yeah, what? client changes. So after yeah. sign on, I can't remember what that was. but 20 tops, maybe. Yeah. So out of what? how many, Eight, 800 on payrolls? Eight, 900 last month, yeah. Yeah, so that's client changes. And we, uh, yeah, so like... Well, like having to sign off by giving the opportunity to make the change, uh yeah it, it alleviates a lot of that with the system that we've got yeah 
Paul, have Jane, you mentioned Jane. risk? Sorry, go on, sorry, Paul. Go on, no, go on, Paul. I, I, we produced a document showing clients how we need them to oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, play to our process, yeah, our rules brilliant. of the game. So we produced one of the pages is a flow chart chart showing each of the steps but then there's several pages to the document explaining why we're doing this and and what the repercussions of them not following the processes are etc so i'm happy to share that with um the community if you want we, we, i have done a video on that that is in the community but if you want to post a document it is in there and then potentially the webinar that we ran as well so we sent them a document and we said we need you to come on to this webinar because there's a change in the process as to how we now need to get information from you so we actually we actually ran a webinar and asked and, and asked them to make sure that they they sent somebody along to it so that they knew how to follow our process. We might be able to share that webinar. I'll just have to check what confidential information was shared within it. But if possible, I can share that with um, the community as well. That that's how we got them following our rules of the game. That's brilliant. So that's this is the Go Proposal community that Paul's referring to, which is just exclusive for Go Proposal members. But if you can post that in there, Paul, that'd be really appreciated. Um, we have got lots of questions here, and I'm still working through them. I really sorry, Paul. Have you mentioned a list of risks and responsibilities? Is that that resource that you're talking about there? Yeah. Well, obviously, we've got the line items in in Go Proposal, so we've got the yeah. service schedules built in there that um, make sure that that's actually signed off in the terms and conditions as in yeah. terms of the risk and respons responsibilities. And then in that uh, process document with all the flow charts, we explain, uh, as Ben was trying to explain there, the sort of changes that happen pre-sign off, which is sort of okay, you know, within with, within reason. But then if there's changes after sign off, then that's when there's going to be a penalty. Because if there's not a penalty, there's no way you're ever going to get them to start behaving and respecting the system. They'll just wait for it to arrive, sign it off. We had this with a tax return recently. Two weeks later, we said, oh, you know, the tax return that I signed off is completely wrong. I've not provided you all the information I needed to. So then we start to explain in, in there that, you know, there's going to have to be a penalty if it's post sign off. So, yeah, ab absolutely all, all the risks and responsibilities. And that's why it's such a, a long winded document because we go into everything. So important. And that gives certainty. The biggest reason why clients won't pay your fee or won't pay a lot is because they lack certainty and trust in the process and the outcomes that you're promising. Documentation like that, clearly communicating that to the client is what gives them the trust to enable you to charge the correct fee. Um, you've got, do you track time through uh, on pay, each payroll through monday.com? The answer is yes, you did that. You don't white label anymore. No, you don't. How do accounts, how do as, how do as accounts, how do we get hold of client payrolls? How does that data transfer work? How do they get hold of client payrolls? Yeah. Oh, so the various options. Obviously, if it's Connect Portal, then you're provided with access so that you can access anything you want via the portal. Um, some of our partners um, don't particularly like the portal or want to use it, so we provide, we furnish them with the information direct. Some like to be CC'd into every payroll pack each month, so it just varies. It depends on the on the partner. Yeah, that's cool. Um, um, what's the process of getting payroll approved by the clients? Yep. So again, uh, depending on the, the rules are set uh, uh, in place on the outset, but we will typically receive the instruction. We will process the payroll. That payroll then will again send a, a sign-off pack to the client. Within there, we put a time frame of when we're expecting them to approve the payroll. Again, we have mechanisms in place if they don't come back within time frames to give them a little nudge. Once it's approved, it then comes back to us, and we we then finish and finalise the payroll. Yeah, that's great. How does it work if the client wants to add in an employee? Do you let us know to add the, in the fee? Yes. That, yeah, so not during the course of the month. That's something you don't need to worry about. We take care of getting that employee added during the course of the month. When we send our schedule at the end of the month based on the work that we've done for that particular tax month, it will itemize, obviously, what how many employees are on there, and you'd see an increase. And I think we actually color it, and we now know there's an increase or decrease. Yeah, that's cool. If the client knows we are using payroll sorted, then how is pricing handled? This means the client can check your prices on your website. So we need to ensure some kind of consistency with our own go proposal numbers versus yours. Yep. So the accountant's price is cheaper. Yep. So if they did go and do that, we'd be more expensive typically anyway. And there's two the two chains of method on there. So what, once we uh, pr pricing on behalf of the account, the extras is easy. So as the extras come up during the course of uh, the payroll cycle, the accountant would tell us, right, okay, let's say hypothetically we were charging the accountant twenty pound for something extra. We'd and from the outset of the onboarding, we'd ask the accountant to tell us what they want us to communicate to the client. So in its most simplest form, let's say there was re-enrollment, we might charge the uh, 
accountant, maybe £50 for re-enrollment, the accountant would say, okay, I don't want to get involved in that. You can communicate to the client that when that does come up, we're going to charge them £100. Yeah, On that's cool. The employee numbers, that should be triggered back to the proposal anyway. So if it's done on a per pay slip price, when the client's signing up in the first instance, they should be made aware it's on a per pay slip and then it typically doesn't need to be communicated if the client from the outset is aware it's on a per per person pay slip price. Does that answer yeah. that question or not? Yeah, that's great. Someone's mentioned there that they've struggled with Go Proposal to set up all the payroll um, line items in there. I'm not sure why that would be a struggle because it comes out of the box ready to use. Is how we've used to price all of our payroll since day one. You can have it fully itemized and you can have each service as complex as possible. It literally takes 30 seconds to import all of those line items. So I'm not sure what the issue is you've had there, but I think Patrick has handled you there in that question. Yeah, um, they can get in touch if they want support as well. Of course, unlimited support. Absolutely. It's cool. Um, are you doing CJRS claims? Yep. Yeah, okay. What platform? Uh, uh, how are telephone minutes monitored and charged to clients? We don't, do, don't charge that way. Okay, cool. How many people do you have processing how many payroll slips? Oh, wow. Well, how many payroll slips have we got? So we have, uh, we've got 12 members of staff. Other than 12 members of staff, we have account managers or seven, eight account managers and the number of pay slips, well, uh, on the website, is it like 15,000 a month, I think, is where we're up to now, aren't we? I don't know. I I, that, yeah. I, Probably should look might. at that more, shouldn't we? <laughs> it's a lot. I know that. It's a lot. That's cool. What about moving mid-year? Are there any extra charges? No, no none. Now, do you guys not still have the same pressures we have uh, that you bunch the work at the month end? How do you handle this? Yep. Month end is a challenge. It's never not going to be a challenge in payroll. But the way that we schedule, um, we uh, we have like a, a graph across the team where we can see where the peaks are. Um, and obviously, we then have to flatten the peaks. So we work with the clients to try and bring things in early. So a month end is always a bit of a challenge. But because we've got resource amongst the team, we can bump things around a lot more easily. Whereas if you've got one person doing it, it's just that person. So I Being fully transparent that. as well. We, we will run fixed payrolls in advance of month end. So if we know we've got a client where the, you know, the, the, it's, their salary is and it never changes, we will run them in advance. We won't send them out in advance, but we will we, we, we will get some run work done at the beginning and during the uh, first few month weeks cool we, we open bright pay up now we send a, an information request for i don't know what the exact terminology is but we send um, an information request on the first um of every calendar month to ask mm -hmm. clients to start providing information so some of them like you say there'll be no changes they'll just provide everything mm -hmm. in the first few days of month. People, they're, they're coming really early yeah, yeah, but that's because we did the webinars, yeah, we did the yeah, documentation, yeah. you know, we've, mm -hmm. we've worked hard. At it. And, and as we say before, someone was just asking, do we use payroll sorted? So just to reinforce, we use payroll sorted and Tara. So Tara is now in that position to be able to have the, you know, the long winded conversations with clients that are about their payroll strategy, you know, not about payroll this month, but about um, how they get on top of getting information from the HR systems, talking about the HR systems that they use and who's responsible. Um, and that, you know, if there's no changes, you know, please provide that information well in advance because it helps us and, and helps you. So we've massively extended that um, payroll information request period now. And in our documentation, it says that we'd like all information within 10 days of your payday, whereas previously we were saying like three. Mm -hmm. It's 10 days to then give a week of back and forth so that by three days for the payroll, everything's so everything's signed, everything's prepared and, and signed off. Yeah, that's cool. One of the really good things that you guys do, Paul, that we actually haven't done on, on our side is that if the client doesn't come back, the rule is that it will get submitted if they don't confirm. So I think that works really well. Yeah, yeah. It's just to stop all, all that chasing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. For anyone outsourcing to you, how do you update the journal from Brightpain to the accounting software? How do we, we don't do that. We'll pipe provide the journal. So we batch them all typically between the first and the fifth of each month. We will batch all the journals together, send them across via a secure file uh, thing, uh, ready for them to be imported into the uh, accountancy so bookkeeping package. Do you recommend HR-based solutions for holiday tracking or do you provide a different solution for employers? Hate holidays. Um, so, <laughs> with, uh, so Brightpay does do it. We charge extra for managing that service. So the Brightpay Connect does offer a holiday uh, tracking feature in there, which we, again, to reiterate, um, all you guys should be charging extra for as well. Uh, there's are a couple of other bits of software that we typically know that are good out there. Uh, we could always put them names in there. But what was the question, James? So yeah, Brightpay does it. Would you, would you track it externally? Such a hard question to answer because it, holidays, 
yeah, it's the bane of our lives tracking the holidays. But yeah, there's software out there developed purely for that that plays yeah. nice to get the data out there, or depending on how many employees there are, uh, BrightPay can handle it as well. Cool. We you use take- Char- we, we use Charlie HR at Map. Very simple but yeah, comprehensive. So wait, didn't know that. That's yeah, it well. works really well. Yeah, so it's really common now, and uh, a lot of our clients have taken it on and loved it as well. Yeah, um, and that's another area where. Uh, Tara will start to develop into as well so part of our strategy is to start to provide that mini HR support um, and, uh, and we're looking closely at BrightPay's features uh, we've not told clients about them yet we've kind of switched them off that ability to do holidays because we just wanted to focus on getting the payroll right but um, in, in the coming months we're going to be speaking to clients about if you know if you want to do um, all in one if you want to track your holidays in the same place you know that thing that's been working really well the last few months to do your payroll where you can now do your holidays in there and we can mm-hmm. provide a mini service for that. Cool. Do you take calls from employees who want to question their pay? No, I've been burnt too many times. I elaborate on that as well. So I personally took a phone call from an employee once. They were asking about what happened on their pay. I told them what had happened. They then went from that conversation I had with that employee, went back to their boss and said, oh yeah, I spoke to the payroll provider. They said, you need to pay me another X amount of money to make it right. That wasn't the conversation I had. So yeah, we will now only communicate. Again, we will give the response so the client can then pass it back onto the employee. But that is a dangerous trap going direct to the employee. So we insist on one point of contact. Uh, at, at the client we've done two videos recently one's to the employer to help them to understand how to read the payroll reports that we send them because mm-hmm. we take for granted that these wonderful reports that we send over make any sense to them but we're actually explaining what all the columns mean and mean and how to understand it and then we've recorded a second video for the employee on how to read and understand their pay slip nice like we, we've had employees come into a saying my payroll's been wrong for 12 months um i opted into an auto enrollment pension scheme and you've not you've not been doing the deductions through my payroll I'm like well nobody told us um and it, like it, there's a lot of debate on this online about who's ultimately responsible for the accuracy of the pay slip uh, that most these ben and Nat might know better than me but most of the research i've seen suggests that the responsibility falls on the employee mm-hmm. um but whoever the responsibility falls on i know you know probably the geeky accountant in me but from day one of being on payrolls myself and receiving payslips i would check my payslip every single month because i wanted to know that i'm being paid the right amount um and i would check it and make sure that i understand it i've been paid properly uh, but clearly not everyone does that um mm-hmm. so we we're, we're now we're now explained that in our video to say look the employee needs to take responsibility um we do we, we prepare this based on the best information provided to us but you as the employer then need to review it here's how you review it and your employee then needs to review it here's how they review it nice yeah. how is hmrc portal access dealt with do you have this in case clients have queries regarding allocation etc if so would we request this info from you when required for account purposes so um, the two ways of doing it, we could obviously apply to be agent and then they come across to our portal or um, a number of our partners, um, it works better. So they keep the access as well as that they could provide us access to their online services, agent services. And we are then allocated only the, the payroll clients that we work on and we can then access them in there. Yeah, so we cool. added an additional user, pretty much additional user that can only see the PAY element of the clients. Uh, mm-hmm. and, that, and, that's, and, yeah, and that's what we use. How do you handle furlough claims? Or are you doing furlough claims? Yes, are we're doing furlough claims. <laughs> we can keep it that. very simple. Uh, yeah. Very simple. We are doing furlough claims, £10 per furlough claim and another pound for each employee. So yeah. if there was uh, 15 employees, we would be charging £25. Cool. Do you keep track of holidays and how? Well, we've answered that one. Yeah. Additional service that we, that we use and typically try not to. What typical <laughs> client questions do you include? What will this get charged? What was that? He says, what typical client questions do you include slash what others get charged? Yeah, so what queries do you include as part of the fixed price and what would not get? Oh, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think our, our thinking around queries is a little bit different. So what we try and do, and this is, we, we actually try and preempt the questions before they come, before they come a question or a query. So what we do, take something as basic as a tax code change. We will implement the tax code like everybody else does, and then you'd send the payroll pack out there, it gets signed off and event down further down the route line is the employee gets their pay slip. They're like, why is my tax code changed? Why is my net pay different? That goes back to the employer and the employer picks the phone up to us and says, why has so-and-so's pay changed? So what we do, our whole the way we approach it, we preempt that question. So when anything changes in the payroll, i.e. a tax code, 
we communicate that with the client at the sign off stage and we will say so and so has had a tax code change this is the result of the tax code change meaning they can net pays and go up or down explain the consequence of it so now what happens is that the, it gives the employer the opportunity to explain that to the employee ahead of payday or if they don't do that we condition the clients gently condition the clients that when the question comes back look at your payroll pack email it's up the top there and that will give you the answer so that that really helps us turn the queries off when it comes to questions cool would i have to pay separately for the payroll software this is an accountant this is lena asking no. this no so what is the cis suffered submission what is it or uh, what is a cis suffered submission yep so uh when they're invoicing out and they're stopped the cis tax that element of the cis tax obviously we're reporting as an eps each month to hmrc yeah I think I've, do they do you do a CJRS submission to HMRC and there's an additional charge for this? Yeah, yep. I've done that. Yeah, okay. Um, I think we've got this. Can we see how Paul's flow that he sends to clients? Yeah, we're going to share that in the, the community. Uh Nicola. Uh are you all your staff based in the UK? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Can we ha can clients have their own bright pay which you access? Mm, we probably wouldn't do that. No, too no. Missed. Yeah, okay. When there's new employees, this will increase the price per month. Do you provide reports so we can accurately update our invoices to our clients? Full schedule, yep. Yeah. Um, I find that a lot of hourly variable payrolls come to us last minute a day or two before payday because they're waiting for timesheet shifts to end, et cetera. How mm -hmm. do you communicate this with clients to get it in sooner? Just an earlier cutoff and the leftover goes into the next month, question mark. No. So, so what, what we don't do with the outsourcing arrangement, we're very mindful, again, going back to what I said in the presentation, these aren't our clients. So what we, what we never look to do is take on a client, then all of a sudden we start enforcing, you know, uh, this is what you've got to do. We typically say we try and condition the client over a three to five month period. And what that allows us doing that three month three to five month period, it allows our account managers to understand the cutoffs in the payroll. So uh, typically every client's got a cutoff and if that cutoff, we just need to understand when it is and that can then help us. So there's always exceptions uh, to, to, to payrolls and we do have some clients where the payroll, um, you know, the cutoff might be the 22nd and the payday is the 25th. And then we, we work with the client to understand that and what we can do. Uh, different scenarios with different clients basically but uh what should happen in that scenario the accountant should be charging more anyway you know if it's got to be a quick turnaround anything less than 48 hours with the clients insisting that's how their internal setup is there should be an additional cost in that from the outset anyway well final question do you run direct only quarterly do you run direct only quarterly question mark so we, we can do so again whatever the accountant partner would outsource to us if they want us to continue to do it quarterly we would do we haven't got many, I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, yeah. I've got annuals, but majority are done a monthly. Yeah, that's cool. Guys, we've we've done it. We've got to the end of the questions. I just want to make it very clear here. You know, we brought you guys in because you're what you, we use at Matt. We don't make any money. With, there's no commercial arrangement that GoPros will have with payroll sorted. We just wanted to kind of bring this masterclass together and bring people who are willing to share from their experiences of what works, what hasn't worked, and what everyone's doing to kind of, you know, make this the very best experience they can for the clients, whilst also, you know, generating a great platform that we can build on and how we can all make this profitable as well. Um, we've got the contact details there. If you want to reach out, you can go to payrollsorted.com forward slash accountants. Some fantastic resources that I would absolutely go and grab. Really good. Thank you again so much for sharing those with you. I know, Natalie, we had to prize those from your hands because you <laughs> saw them as such valuable. I know that there were a lot of blood, sweat, and tears that had gone into them. Yeah. So really, yeah. really value what you really appreciate you sharing those. Go propose if you're not with GoProposal yet dive in goposal.com forward slash sign up you can go and import all of the pricing into there and if you're an existing goposal member you can add on oversuite as well and we'll take care of all your engagement letters and we you can download all of the service schedules attached to pay all sorted if there's any questions that any of you have got that we've not answered or that you wanted to ask personally please reach out to the emails that we'll be sending you a video of this will be shared with you after this webinar along with a couple of other links as well we'll also be posting this in the community the goposal facebook community and that's where Paul will be posting uh, the link, some, again, really, really valuable resources. And I've asked,
Paul, those for those before. I think you're a little bit hesitant to share those before, Paul, because of how much effort you've put into them. So I'm so grateful that you're sharing those. Another hugely generous uh, act from you, Paul. Thank you so much for sharing that brilliant, valuable resource. Guys, I would like to thank everyone on here for listening, for giving up your time. I hope you've been rewarded with the value that you've got for the hour and 36 minutes that you have put into this. We had 300 members onto this, 300 participants at its peak, which is absolutely incredible. People are committed to looking at how they can serve their clients more and looking to evolve their practice. Ben, Natalie and Paul, would you like to say your thank yous and goodbyes? Yeah. No, thanks yeah. very much. I'm, I'm just uh, glad I made it through it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thanks ever so much, guys. Yeah, and uh, any questions that come out of this as well, we're, we're, and again, anything that want to, how we do things, give us a shout. We're happy to share it all. Yeah, I think if it's not private, confidential questions, and I'd urge people to use the community just because yep. there might be things that will help other members of the yep, community like we've done today as well with, with our answers. And it also means that, you know, I can chip in as well as Ben, Atley, um, and, and James. There's been a few other documents that have now been requested of me. So I've just asked uh, Morgan <laughs> at Go Proposal uh, to pull together a list because there's we've got hundreds of questions in the chat and the Q&A here. So everything's recorded. If Morgan can pull that list of all the things that have been asked of from me uh, i'll put them all in the GoPuzzle community and then we can continue the conversation in there yeah that's cool and if we can just find out as well morgan who was the lady oh it was shrewsbury biscuits not strawberry biscuits if you can just contact jean lunt and if we can get a pack of homemade shrewsbury biscuits sent as well wheat free that would be appreciated as well guys thank you so much thanks to everyone been wonderful cheers thank you, thank you.